Now, there are um, so many uh, different things that we could spend time thinking about, talking about uh, during uh, Bible classes like this on a Sunday morning. Um, but under the circumstances and given the, the times that we are in and the responsibility that we have, uh, very good to spend some time talking about this um, issue or a subject of the theology of public life. And I pray that's going to serve us well in the years to come. I think as we get to the point of making some application uh, for our church in particular and uh, drawing some implications from this, uh, it'll make even more sense to you. And that uh, time is drawing near uh, where we'll do that. So we've entered into a part of this study where we're considering the historical theology associated with a theology of public life. And we've been looking at how a theology of public life, that thinking has been cultivated over centuries of the church. We began uh, in the early church where the early church very clearly saw a distinction between the church and the state. And we're working out uh, in terms of really in the context of severe persecution working out the relationship between the church and the state, working out the relationship between uh, the individual Christian and civil authority. Uh, we spent some time, obviously, talking about that through Romans 13 and what Paul means there in Romans 13, what the Lord intends for us to understand from Romans 13, uh, not what uh, much of modern-day evangelicalism has accepted with respect to Romans 13. We wanted to get at the biblical truth with respect to that text. And we see texts like that influencing the, the thought of the early church theologians. Uh, we moved on to uh, Constantine and Augustine, and in particular, Augustine's thinking with respect to the city of God and the city of man. And then we looked last week very broad overview of the medieval period and the tug of war between church and state authority, jurisdiction during the medieval period. And so this morning we come to uh, the Reformation and to talk about the reformers. And again, another step forward in the development of this thought. Uh, and it's going to take real shape um, really with the, the founding of the colonies, the American colonies, um, uh, after the Reformation, and we'll see that more next week. Okay, Luther, at the time of the Reformation, Reformation really sparked, um, there, were, there, were, there were many events, many causes, seeds that you could point to that led to the Reformation, but um, sort of chief among those or foremost among those in our thinking, our understanding, uh, was the life and theology of Martin Luther, a uh, monk. And uh, Luther, um, the Lord saved Martin Luther, and Luther came to an understanding of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, those words alone being very important. And um, so Luther uh, came to understand the true biblical gospel. And there was, during the period of Reformation, uh, a recovery of the true gospel that had uh, essentially um, been lost uh, amidst the predominant church at the time, a, a Roman Catholicism, had been lost for centuries. And um, it wasn't that it was gone completely. There were genuine believers at that time, uh, genuine, uh, real biblical churches teaching a biblical gospel. But it was so overwhelmed, covered up uh, by this um, incipient Roman Catholicism that the gospel was, um, for all intents and purposes, among the masses of people, uh, was lost. And so uh, Martin Luther, uh, in struggling with uh, justification by faith alone in Christ alone, uh, came to an understanding of God's law. His understanding of God's law and his own circumstances really led Luther to think about and develop a, a theology of public life that Luther's written about. And I want to give you an article that you can find online and read for yourself. It's really helpful. And um, uh, led us um, to understand uh, this subject a little more clearly as well. So let's begin with the life of Luther. And let's look at Romans chapter 1 quickly. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. And just briefly, an overview of Luther's conversion. Uh, justification, or right standing with God, our declaration of innocence, as it were. Uh, the declaration that God makes of us that we are just is based upon the imputed or gifted, given righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that through faith alone in Christ alone. When you turn from your sin and repentance and put faith in Jesus Christ, then uh, 
we are justified on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, our sin is imputed to the Lord Jesus Christ. He bore our sin uh, at the cross. His righteousness imputed to us is a free gift of God's grace. And it's by virtue of his righteousness that we are declared righteous ourselves or declared just. It's how we're saved. And we're not saved uh, because God just sort of swept our sin under a rug or turns a blind eye to our sin. Our sin has to be dealt with dealt with. Every sin going to be paid for. It's either going to be paid by you in eternity in hell, or it's paid by Jesus Christ at the cross. Uh, And if Jesus Christ paid for your sin at the cross, then his righteousness is yours through faith. And it's on the basis of his righteousness that we're justified. The moment that you put saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have heaven, right? The moment that you believe, that's a glorious thought to me. The moment that you believe, you put faith in Jesus Christ, you have all of the riches uh, that are uh, in him, all of the blessings that are afforded you by his spirit in him, you have heaven. Um, it was that conviction that um, dawned upon Martin Luther, as it were, in his study of Romans chapter 1, in particular verses 16 and 17, and what led Martin Luther um, to a biblical understanding of the gospel. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just or the righteous shall live by their faith. So here's Luther's own words on the text, on the subject, okay? Luther's own words on this passage. Luther said, I greatly long to understand Paul's epistle to the Romans, and nothing stood in the way but that one expression, the justice of God or the righteousness of God, because I took it to mean that righteousness whereby God is righteous and deals righteously in punishing the unjust. You see Luther's point. Luther saw God's righteousness, God being righteous, as a cause for God to be angry with the wicked and to deal with them in righteousness by punishing their unrighteousness, right? It's the way that Luther saw the passage. He says, my situation was that although an impeccable, blameless monk, I stood before God as a sinner troubled in conscience and had no confidence that my merit would assuage him in the system of Roman Catholicism. uh, Most Roman Catholics uh, may, probably would not understand, many of them may understand that it's not um, that they're saved. They wouldn't say necessarily that they're saved by grace plus works. Um, they believe that baptism would wash away, as it were, original sin, do away with original sin. And many Roman Catholics would even assert that they're saved, that we're saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ. But what happens with a Roman, in the Roman Catholic system is that as soon as you are justified, so to speak, any mortal, mortal or venial sin and you lose your just standing with God uh, because of your sin, and that just standing with God, that justification has to be restored, and the way that it is restored is through system of penance, a system of works, uh, and that's where the works righteousness comes into Roman Catholicism. It's this um, never-ending series of Um, re-justifying yourself, as it were, through works of penance in order to maintain right standing with God. And Martin Luther saw himself as um, guilty and continuously guilty. He would go into confession, sometimes as many as six hours a day, confessing his sins to a priest and walk out and realize that he'd forgotten one or two or walk out and sin again. And it was this constant um, hamster wheel, as it were, um, that... um, Luther came to the conviction, came to the conclusion, there was simply nothing that he could do that would assuage God's wrath toward him. Therefore, Luther says, I did not love a just and angry God, but rather hated and murmured against him. Yet I clung to the dear Paul and had a great yearning to know what he meant. Night and day I pondered until I saw the connection between the righteousness of God and the statement that the just shall live by his faith. That word righteous and that word just, often synonymous, okay? Then I grasped that the justice or the righteousness of God is that righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy, God justifies us through faith. 
Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through the open gates into paradise. The whole of scripture took on a new meaning that we needed in order to be righteous in God's sight that Luther began to see now as a gift of the gospel, as a gift of God's grace, and saw the righteousness of God that was revealed in the gospel as that free gift, uh, not the justice of God in his wrath against sinners. And it was through that that Luther came to an understanding of the gospel, that by faith alone, we believe upon, entrust ourselves to Jesus Christ, and we are forgiven of our sin, uh, declared righteous in his sight. It's a righteousness that is given to us freely by God's grace in Christ immediately and fully when we place our faith and our trust in him. In a moment, Luther had the peace with God that he longed for. Um, Luther was genuinely converted. Uh, Later, the motto of the Reformation under Luther's lead would become post tenebras lux or lux, after darkness light. Uh, And after this great period of darkness that predominated during the medieval period, uh, the light of the gospel shines uh, during the Reformation. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. No less a recovery of the biblical gospel uh, from the perversion of works righteousness that we see under uh, Roman Catholicism. That led to a difficulty for Luther, an initial difficulty, reconciling Um, the law to the gospel and the relationship of law to gospel. Uh, Look at Romans chapter 3 and look at verse 19. Flip the page there to the right. Romans 3, 19. Initially, Luther saw these as two entirely distinct things, law and gospel. And where there was gospel, it would cast out all law. Where there was law, there was no room for the gospel. And so saw these two things as completely distinct and uh, struggled just a bit for a period of time with the relationship of law to gospel. So in Romans chapter 3, verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, the law says it to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Uh, No work of the law could bring any merit with God whatsoever. The law could only expose our great guilt. Now, this is true of every person. Every person, the law exposes our guilt. We are in bondage to sin. Fallen man is totally depraved, if you understand what those words mean, um, such that we are shut up. We have absolutely no case before God. Uh, We have to merely put our hand over our mouth. We can't say anything. Um, Natural tendency of fallen man is to make a case, right? To justify himself and to uh, plead with God on our own merits. Uh, We can't do that under the law. The whole world becomes guilty before God. Verse 20, therefore... By the deeds of the law, by the works of the law, by obedience, by any of our good works, no flesh will be justified, reconciled, made right before God in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. There's nothing else that comes through the law. Knowledge of sin. No one is justified by keeping the law or doing anything under the law. The law cannot justify. Verse 21. But now, you see the contrast? But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. We find it in our Old Testaments. Even the righteousness of God given through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. It's a gift. And it's not merited by any individual person. There's there's nothing that would earn the gift, right? For all, verse 23, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Uh, That's the doctrine of imputation. It's giftedness. It's um, a crediting or accounting, an accounting of righteousness to our account. It's not the Roman Catholic view of infused righteousness, right? Right? God gives us the power, we work and work and work, and through our working, 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 we become more and more and more righteousness. It's not an infused righteousness by which we are made practically righteous. It's a declared 
gifted, accounted, credited righteousness. And we are, from the moment of that accounting, as it were, we are declared perfectly righteous. As if we had never sinned, and as if we had kept the law perfectly with one declaration, with the gift of God, a gift of God's grace in Jesus Christ. Far different than the Roman Catholic system, right? Uh, we are declared righteous, counted righteous, not obviously, um, not entirely made righteous. We still struggle with our sin, don't we? Uh, Luther would call it an alien righteousness or a foreign righteousness, a righteousness counted to us, not found within us. Um, and that's what we need. We need a righteousness that comes from outside of us, a righteousness that isn't ours because we have none. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, the prophet says. Um, Luther found that the perfect righteousness that was needed, he found that in the gospel. So verse 24 then, being justified freely by his grace, by grace alone, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation, a satisfaction by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. I really look forward to getting into that text in a few weeks. That's going to be really good, uh, really juicy. So I'm anxious to get there. Um, we'll talk about that then. That's a mouthful. And we'll get to what that all means uh, in a few weeks. Justification. Right standing with God is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone for his righteousness. Uh, God will not compromise. God will not negotiate or diminish or undermine his own righteousness. His perfect justice or his perfect standard, all of that is upheld so that God continues to be just, righteous, and the justifier of those who put faith alone in Christ. It's how God can reconcile wicked sinners to himself apart from their keeping this perfect standard of the law. It's through an imputed righteousness. Um, so Luther, other early reformers, conceived of the law then from Romans chapter 3 predominantly as having two fundamental purposes. First, the law according to Romans 3, shows us our guilt and therefore points us to Jesus Christ and the gospel. In other words, the law acts as a mirror. The first use of the law is that the law acts as a mirror to show us our sin, to show us our unrighteousness and to drive us to Christ. Paul says that uh, the law became our tutor, our paedagogos. It was a uh, um, a tutor was someone who used the discipline. <laughs> it wasn't merely someone who uh, tutored you in math. It was someone who tutored you in math with a belt in their hand. Right? You know, that kind of a tutor, okay? The law was our paedagogos. It was our disciplinarian, our tutor to point us, to drive us to Jesus Christ. So the first use of the law is to act as a mirror. The second use of the law um, was that through fear of punishment, the law is restraint on evil. The law is to restrain evil. If you look at those two uses of the law, one is to bring a person to conversion, the other is to restrain wickedness, and what do we see in those two uses of the law? We really see Augustine's two cities, city of God and the city of man. In the city of man, civil authority was used to restrain evil, it's the second use of the law. Uh, and in the city of God, the law was used to bring people to conversion, to make them citizens of the city of God. And so that wasn't lost on Luther. Luther understood Augustine's uh, city of God, city of man as well, and saw those two uses of the law. Eventually, and not long after, really uh, in Luther's own time, uh, a third use of the law from Scripture was given or was um, written about, and we find this to be eminently biblical, uh, and that is that the, rule, the law is a rule of right conduct for the Christian. Three uses of the law, right? If we think about law, three uses of the law. One, it acts as a mirror, shows us our guilt, drives us to Jesus Christ. Two, it's a restraint on wickedness, and we find that use of the law in civil authority. Third, it's a rule of conduct for the Christian. In other words, the law hasn't been done away with. And we can just live as we please without law, antinomianism, antinomianism, uh, antinomos, against the law, living as though there were no law. Um, 
That's not the way that it is. God's moral law is a reflection of his own character. It's a reflection of who God is. So as long as we are going to relate to God, we relate to God according to his character, who he is and what he expects of us. We do that now through the gospel. And the law under the gospel becomes a rule of conduct for the life of the Christian. And because of God's spirit, because God has changed our hearts, we have the ability in his grace and by his spirit to obey him. Um, so three uses of the law. Now, the first two uses of the law were important to the reformers in understanding the relationship between church and state. This understanding of the law, coupled with Augustine's city of God, helped Luther formulate a concept of the relationship between church and state. For Augustine, if you remember, there were two cities, the city of man, which is this world in rebellion against God, and there was the city of God, and that was made up of redeemed humanity. Luther took that and tweaked that a bit and really conceived of a theology of public life, in particular a political theology, as two kingdoms. So not two cities now, but two kingdoms. Both of those kingdoms belonging to God, a right-hand kingdom and a left-hand kingdom. Sort of took that from Matthew, from Matthew 25 and the judgment of the sheep and the goats, those on his right and those on his left, right? The right-hand kingdom was that kingdom which was spiritual, it was internal, it was invisible, right? No need for coercion, no need for violence, no need for the penal sanctions of law anymore, no need for condemnation anymore, because citizens of that kingdom have been transformed. They've been indwelt by God's spirit, they have new hearts, and they freely, willingly long to obey God. Um, and so there's no need for penal sanctions of the law any longer, just need a guide, need a rule of life for how they are to conduct themselves, and they will, in the power of the Spirit, conduct themselves accordingly. Uh, the first use of the law um, would drive them to Christ. The second use of the law really was no need. It was the third use of the law that applies in this kingdom. Uh, so in that sense, sort of um, no need <laughs> for civil authority. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 Paul says, knowing this, and this was sort of Luther's thinking on this, Paul says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane. The law was made, Paul says, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. The law was for sinners, in other words. And that's the way that Luther uh, conceived of this too. Uh, two kingdoms in the left-hand kingdom. The left-hand kingdom was that physical, external, visible, king, the visible world. These two kingdoms both belong to God. Both are subject to God. God operates within both, but two different kingdoms altogether, do you see? Um, the left-hand kingdom still operates under divine authority, um, but the authority that God institutes for the left-hand kingdom is the authority of the church and the authority of the, of the state, civil authority. And or civil authority had a, a sword as well, um, but in Luther's um, thinking, um, God commanded both swords, but the church didn't wield both, if that makes sense. Um, the visible and invis invisible church distinction sort of grew out of Luther's thought. You have a visible body, a visible kingdom, and an invisible kingdom. Um, the visible kingdom made up of both those in the right hand and those in the left. Um, the invisible, only those on the right, only genuinely converted people, okay? Okay. Two kingdoms. Left-hand kingdom needed the institution of civil authority and the institution of the church. Did both civil government and the visible church. Let me stop and ask if, at this point if there are any questions. I know we want to stop every now and then, stop rambling and let you ask questions if there are any. Yes, Alex. Giving a history lesson here, but hopefully weaving some theology in there too. Yeah. Um, so if we have the... Uh Imputated righteousness of Christ, why should we keep the law as Christians today if First Timothy 1.8 says the law is not made for a righteous person? Yeah, good question. So why 
would it be necessary for Christians, if, if we've been forgiven of all our sin, this question comes up, doesn't it? If, we're, if we've been forgiven of all our sin, if we are no longer under the condemnation of law, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, then what's the point of Christians keeping the law? Why then the law? Paul's going to answer, uh, ask and answer that question in a year. <laughs> in, in Romans, trying to think how many sermons is that going to be from, from Romans 3 to Romans 6. Uh, he's going to deal with that question very extensively in Romans 6. Uh, we're going to get there. I think a year is doable. Um, but why, why would that be? Let's, let's open that up. Why would, why would um, a Christian... Why would we need the law as of, of God to his people? Like if you look at uh, Ezekiel 36, it says that God is going to write his law within okay. your heart. Very good. Uh, so, so the new covenant as a, as a condition or as a promise, a promise of the new covenant, God says, I'm going to cause you to keep my law. You will walk in all my statutes and judge. Will, Noel, why is that though? Why this relationship to law? Uh, oh, I think two reasons. One is that the um, the creator creature distinction, whether you're saved yeah. or not, doesn't go away. So we're still obligated before God. Also, too, the law of God teaches us how to live pleasing in His sight. Yeah, and very since a Christian desires that, they their heart is drawn toward that. Yeah. So the Christian wants to. Yeah, I think really wrapped up in those two, and that um, the creator creature distinction really, really important in understanding that um, God created us as image bearers. We bear his image. A large part, a predominant part of that image that we bear of God is a moral image. We don't look like him. God does not have a physical body. We don't act like him. God is entirely other, but we have um, uh, communicable attributes that we reflect of God and they reflect his moral character, his moral nature. And so we live in accord with his law as image bearers in order to glorify him and God will be glorified in his creation. So Tom, thank you, Sergio. We're also saved to obey his commandments. Yeah. Amen. And the Lord says in, in John 14, Verse 15, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yeah, amen. And the apostle Paul also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, in verse 19, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Amen. Yeah. So we're, we're saved unto obedience. Yeah, amen. And, amen. And enabled to, to obey him. Yeah, by the Spirit of God. Seems, it seems uh, lost on the professing church today, <laughs> much of the professing church, that anytime you talk about obedience, all of a sudden now you're a legalist. No, it's, we've been saved to obey him. Paul's apostleship, Paul has been, he says, made an apostle for the obedience of faith among all nations for his name, for obedience. So yeah, it's very important that we obey the Lord. And that's, you know, it goes back to our relationship to God. So good question, brother. And um and, and that, that is what gave rise then to the third use of the law, really. And what is the relationship of the law then to the genuine Christian? It's a rule of conduct. It shows us how we are to live uh, for him. Paul said, I would, have not, I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Right? The law teaches us and instructs us uh, how we're to live. And we know the negative points of the law, the positive points of the law, there is much more depth to the law than a thou shalt not murder. And we find that out quickly in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Uh, and how the law is expanded by the Lord himself. So, okay. Um, so the left hand came, right hand kingdom, spiritual, internal, invisible, the left hand, this is in Luther's thinking, left hand kingdom, really the kingdom of this world, the visible external, physical. In that left-hand kingdom, left-hand kingdom needed civil authority to restrain wickedness, needed ecclesiastical or church authority to point sinners to the gospel. Um, and so the left-hand kingdom included civil government and the visible church. The visible church responsible for religious education, responsible for religious practice, has authority over external conduct of the people, 
uh, as did the civil authority, the government um, also had authority over external conduct. Um, both bore swords, as it were, in Luther's thinking, to restrain evil. Um, the sword of the church was excommunication or church discipline, which if you remember that time, during the time of the Reformation, everybody was required to go to church, right? Uh, if you lived in an area, uh, there was a, a local parish, as it were, and you were required to go. Uh, it became law uh, to go to church at, at, at one point. And uh, so everybody was included, as it were, in the church. And you were included in the church at that time through baptism. Um, not circumcised any longer the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Uh, believers began to be baptized as infants by the Roman Catholic Church because that was the, the way that... Related, related to the church uh, was through baptism. So you were baptized into the church as it were. And so in order to associate, you know, the infant mortality rate was through the roof. Many, 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 many infants died in childbirth. Many mothers died in childbirth. And um, so because of the very high infant mortality rate, um, infants uh, as young as they could be were baptized into the church because salvation was through the church. That made sense. Um, in Roman Catholicism. All that to say is that, that this was the authority that the visible church, the civil authority, wielded uh, at the time of the Reformation. Um, to Luther, in Luther's thinking, the visible church and the civil authority had no right to bind the conscience. Only God could bind the conscience through his word, and that was only for those in the right-hand kingdom. And so both the church and the state um, exercised an authority over external conduct, not internal heart, right? Um, God looks upon the heart, man looks on the outward appearance. So um, as long as they did not buy into the conscience, the state and the church had this overlapping authority to restrain evil. It was back to the two swords doctrine, right? We talked about last week, two swords. Um, however, uh, the left-hand kingdom was not a lesser sword, as it were, uh, or the civil authority was not a lesser sword under the authority of the church. There were two distinct, in Luther's thinking, there were two distinct swords. Really what this reminds us of, in what Luther and other reformers were conceiving of, was a modern day theocracy. Um, we've talked about before the continuity or discontinuity between Old Testament and New Testament, Right? The more continuity that you see between Old Testament and New Testament, um, I'm going to use these terms, we can talk about them later. Uh, the more continuity that you see, the more covenantal you are. The more discontinuity that you see, the more dispensational you are, if you understand what those terms are. Um, but continuity and discontinuity. And so for the reformers, initially, there was great continuity. So if we, we you, you're used to this drawing, um, here are the people of God, right? Um, to become, um, this is, they're the people of God by virtue of the new covenant, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And to be um, a member of this people, so to speak, you are um, a member of this people by grace through faith in Christ, right? You put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're here. So in this circle, so to speak, are all those from all of history who have put, by virtue of faith in Jesus Christ, were made uh, the people of God, were justified in God's sight. That includes Adam, <laughs> includes Noah, a preacher of righteousness, includes Abraham, and down through history includes you and me, if we've returned from our sin and put our trust in Jesus Christ. This is the people of God, the people of, through faith in Jesus Christ, are, by virtue of the new covenant, for them, not yet established. For us, it's been established. It was established at the cross. But by virtue of that covenant, this is the people of God, okay? What God did through Abraham is the, there's this physical component that was added um, to the promise. Here's the promise, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ would come, crush the head of the serpent. Um, so this is the promise this was added to the promise was the covenant of circumcision, right? And we've talked about that on Sunday morning now in Romans chapter 2. Um, the Abrahamic covenant added circumcision. You're circumcised, you're in the covenant. If you're not circumcised, you're cut off. And so there was this um, veil, as it were, that was added. 
the veil of circumcision. So anyone who was going to come into this circle had to be circumcised in order to be in that circle. Um, Later, under Moses, God added the law, the Mosaic covenant, Mosaic administration, the law of Moses. So this became what would come to be known as a middle wall of separation, separation between Jew and Gentile. And so anyone coming into this circle through faith in Jesus Christ would have, as an expression of their faith, obeyed the tenets of the Mosaic law and would have been circumcised, would have been ceremonially washed, would have kept the feast days, right? Would have obeyed the Mosaic uh, covenant. Of those that did that were, for example, Caleb. Caleb was a Kenite. Caleb would have had to have become a Jew, in order to be in the covenant. Rahab was a Gentile. Rahab became a Jew. Rahab was saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. That's how Rahab was in the circle. But as an expression of Rahab's faith, what would she have done? She would have obeyed the Mosaic covenant. Um, she would have been ceremonially washed. She would have kept the feast days. She would have, right? Um, she would have obeyed the law of Moses. Um, and so under Jesus Christ, for example, um, under Jesus Christ, the middle wall of separation is taken down, right? Um, the, the veil in the temple is rent from top to bottom. And now Gentiles, no longer having to come through the veil, as it were, of the Mosaic administration, Gentiles now come into the people of God through, by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. There is no longer any middle wall of separation. There is no longer any distinction, as it were, between Jew and Greek, slave, free, male, female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. God, Ephesians chapter 2, called to those who are once afar off, strangers to the covenants of promise, without hope in the world, without God and without hope. And he brought them near through the blood of Jesus Christ, right? This circle has always been the same. Always been the same, same as it was when Adam, same as it is today, one people of God, but that people, the, the way that they come in or the, um, has changed, right? That Mosaic covenant has been done away with. In the minds of Roman Catholics and in the minds of reformers and still to some degree in the minds of Presbyterians today, there is some form of covenant <laughs> that exists around that, that um, for Martin Luther, this is the invisible church, the right-hand kingdom, this circle. This is the left-hand kingdom. And this kingdom includes everybody in the world. Visible, external, physical, needs both civil authority and ecclesiastical or church authority The right-hand kingdom just needs ecclesiastical authority, right? Just needs the church. We just need um, God, his law. So in the left-hand kingdom, uh, needs both civil and ecclesiastical. For the reformers then, um, because both civil and ecclesiastical authority was necessary, this... And that, that derived from the Mosaic Covenant, from the Old Testament, right? Thinking about the Old Testament in that way, applying the Old Testament to current civil and ecclesiastical structure and doing that inappropriately, right? This, um, the kingdom of God is not the kingdoms of this world. Jesus Christ, my kingdom is not of this world, right? We're talking about two separate kingdoms altogether, right? But what the reformers were trying to do, what Roman Catholicism has done is effectively make... Um, A modern day Mosaic administration. Um, Presbyterians today believe in a visible church and an invisible. Now, we'll, we'll sometimes use terms like that. We mean something slightly different when we use them. Visible to Presbyterians includes those who are genuinely converted and those who are not. The the sons and daughters of believers are in this visible um, kingdom, so to speak, um, given the sign and what some would say the seal of baptism as our participation in this visible kingdom as a seal or a guarantee that they'll one day be in this kingdom. Kingdom. So what Presbyterians do today is they baptize their infant. This is their understanding of the covenant. They baptize their infants as a sign and a seal of 
their participation in this covenant community, the visible church, uh, in the expectation that they'll one day be in the invisible church through faith. Does that make sense? Um, and it really is a, a misapplication, uh, too much continuity between Old Testament, Old Covenant, and New Covenant. That wall has been torn down. And now there is no other covenant <laughs> under which anyone today is in any kind of relationship with God but the New Covenant alone. There is no other covenant. There is no co other covenant under which infants can be baptized into a covenant. What kind of a covenant community are we talking about? There is no covenant community outside the new covenant community. And those in the new covenant community are only there by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And most infants aren't putting faith, turning from their sin and putting faith in Jesus Christ, right? Uh, if you've been around an infant, they're living headlong in their sin. <laughs> uh, right. So, uh, um, but so that, does that make sense? The, the, the distinction between um, continuity and discontinuity. What the, the kingdoms to Luther, the kingdoms to the reformers in their minds was more or less, and I don't want to oversimplify that, but more or less a uh, trying to establish in their context too much continuity between the Mosaic covenant and the new covenant, establishing uh, a, a theocracy, if you will, a theocracy-like relationship between church and state that more or less looks like Old Testament Israel. That's where the hierarchy of government inside Lutheranism, inside Presbyterianism, certainly inside Roman Catholicism, that's where that comes from. That's where infant baptism persists. It was started under Roman Catholicism. It persists in Presbyterianism. It persists in Lutheranism, a lot of Protestant churches, infant baptism uh, is just a wrong view of Old Testament Israel, a wrong view, too much continuity between New Covenant and the Mosaic administration. Uh, Presbyterians will say, Lutherans will say, that the Mosaic Covenant and the New Covenant are the same covenant that the only difference is administration, that the Mosaic Covenant is a covenant of grace, but it is administered differently. The New Covenant is a covenant of grace, but administered differently. They're putting, they're making them like this when they're like this. Hebrews says the Old Covenant has gone away. It is deleted. It's been done away with. No longer stands, right? Sixto. So uh, is that something that Luther believes or is that something that came later? That's something that Luther believed um, and something that was um, uh, developed uh, over time uh, after Luther. Uh, so eventually, um, a man by the name of Heinrich Bullinger would write a defense of infant baptism from the covenants um, and would defend the, in, in the light of initially, they were called rebaptizers, the Anabaptists. We'll talk about them in a minute. Um, and Baptists coming on the scene. Heinrich Bollinger wrote a defense of infant baptism, and he based it on exactly that, on the, on the understanding of the covenants. There is no, yeah, I ask, you know, the question, it's really a simple question, uh, and that for Presbyterians today. Um, under what covenant are believers, are children of believers, under what covenant are they in relationship with God? The only answer they can, that you can give for that is the new covenant. That's not, the, that's not the new covenant. The new covenant, God says in the new covenant, Jeremiah chapter 31, I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. <laughs> that's a blessing of the new covenant. Do the children of believers, by virtue of their birth in a Christian home, are they forgiven of their sin and their sins God remembers no more? No. No. They have to come to faith in Jesus Christ for that to be the case, to be members of the new covenant. It's almost like saying, we're going to talk about this this morning in the service, it's almost like the Jewish formalists saying, we have Abraham as our father. John the Baptist say, do not say to yourselves that you have Abraham as your father. God can raise up sons of Abraham from these stones, right? Do not say to yourself, you were born into a Christian home and you have the sign and the seal of baptism, 
and that you're in the covenant community. Don't say that to yourselves, right? There is, there is no covenant under which the children of believers are in relationship to God. There is no covenant today under which those people that inhabit a little slice of land on the eastern side of the Mediterranean, there is no covenant under which those people are in relationship to God other than the new covenant. The new covenant through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only covenant today under which people, anybody, is in relationship to God, right? But for the reformers coming out of Roman Catholicism, this, if you can imagine, very confusing, very difficult, right? Very difficult. We, we have the light of centuries of thought, centuries of scholarship on this particular issue. They didn't have the benefit of that. They're working things out as they go. And they're coming straight out of, straight out of Roman Catholicism, right? Where this has been talked about, thought, have been a predominant part of their thinking for centuries. And so uh, we understand the difficulty associated with that. Um, we would simply say today our, to our Presbyterian brothers and sisters, <laughs> to other Protestant denominations, finish the Reformation, right? finish, finish what was started. Uh, Reformed Baptists, Reformed Baptists have Reformed. Um, we were, Reformed Baptists are the only ones who've gone all the way in that Reformation. They need to catch up and keep, keep moving along, okay? And we say that um, lovingly. I don't mean to be crass about that, but let's be, let's be uncompromising with the truth. Right, what we're talking about is the truth. Um, so um, I'm not going to mince words about it either. Um, Presbyterians are wrong and Lutherans are wrong. Protestant, those Protestant denominations are wrong. Um, they need to stop baptizing children. There is, no, there is no covenant under which a child is in relationship to God other than the new covenant. That child needs to put faith and trust in Jesus Christ, turn from their sin, right? Um, so we want to take a stand for the truth. Questions? Alex? Um, besides the... Uh well, I know the like one or two passages in the New Testament that says, and the household was, yep. you know, baptized. Besides that, is there any application in the New Testament for infant baptism or what you're talking about? No, and that's not one either. So, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, um, household, household uh, does not imply or implicate that infants are being baptized. Um, but um, in if you can imagine, for example, where that takes place in Acts 10 with Cornelius, right? Peter comes and preaches the gospel. The Holy Spirit falls upon that household, all those who are assembled there. Who are we to say that God, yeah, they, they heard the word at the preaching, right? So it wasn't um, superstitious, you know, devoid of the truth of God. It was at the preaching of the gospel that Cornelius and his household heard the gospel understood the gospel, responded in repentant faith, and were baptized, right? There's nothing there to suggest that because he used the word oikonomos, that their infants were baptized. And nowhere, in that, that, you know, that was the very first argument, the very first argument that um, after the Reformation, that Baptists used to say what you're doing is, is unbiblical. It's the regulative principle of worship. They saw no warrant in scripture to baptize infants and so they argued against it. And no infants in, in church history uh, or in the Bible that are baptized. So if we don't see it in the Bible, we shouldn't be doing it, right? And that was before they began to further understand the covenants and the covenantal um, argument against it. So, Okay, in the reformers' thinking then, that led to this confusion between the kingdoms, right? And we live in the left-hand kingdom where it's all under the authority of God, but um, there's civil authority and there's church authority in the left-hand kingdom. And in Luther's thinking and the reformers' thinking, those two things were entirely separate. They were entirely distinct. So later, when Calvin comes along, um, Calvin takes this one step further, sees a distinction between civil and ecclesiastical authority. Often that council advised magistrates or civil authority, but had no civil or judicial authority itself. But that council of churches began to have its own government, Councils were added to councils, and pretty soon um, Luther, Calvin, others began to use bishops in the church as a hierarchical structure. So what are they doing? They're mirroring Roman Catholicism, which Roman Catholicism is mirroring Old Testament Israel, right? Roman Catholicism has a priesthood. It has a pope, <laughs> a high priest, as it were. Um, there's a magisterium or a judicial branch. Uh, it's too much continuity. They're mirroring Old Testament Israel. And Calvin, Luther, other reformers began to do the same. And this led to the involvement of the state. Calvin formed a consistory made up of representatives from both civil and church authority. 
It was a mixed church-state institution, not unlike Luther's left-hand kingdom, uh, that regulated conduct. And so both the church and the state could punish um, external conduct uh, when there was a moral failure or a breach of required practice. Um, Like Luther, the concept of Old Testament covenant was transferred to the relationship of church and state, uh, and there became this concept of what's called a covenantal civil government. Covenantal civil government. A pattern after God's dealings with Israel in the Exodus. God asked Israelites, and you still hear this argument from Presbyterians today. God asked the Israelites in the Exodus, uh, at the Exodus, um, three times if they would affirm the covenant. Three times the Israelites affirmed the covenant. The covenant, and so the Israelites then consented. Will be His people. He will be our God, and that was to the Presbyterians to in a sense a covenant of grace, um, because God entered into covenant with the people. They gave birth to a lot of this. Um, this was expanded into Presbyterian polity and church government. All were members of the covenant through birth, therefore baptism into the church. It was into this context quickly that Conrad Grebel of the Swiss, Swiss Brethren um, began a movement that would later be called Anabaptism, or the Anabaptists, rebaptizers. Um, where conversion was necessary to enter the church, not simply birth, um, conversion was necessary, and that baptism followed conversion. Both the Roman Catholic Church and Reformers at the time would persecute Anabaptists and later Baptists. We did not derive from Anabaptism. We're, we didn't. Come, we came from English Puritans in the 1640s. Baptists, Baptists derived from English Puritanism in the 1640s. There was this heretical sect that were, was called Anabaptists. There were the Anabaptists. From Anabaptists came, um, for example, um, the, the, the Quakers, the Mennonites, the Amish came out of Anabaptism. The Baptists came from English Puritans in the 1640s. Um, But they believed, one of the things that they believed was in believer's baptism or baptism that followed conversion. And so um, that began to take a root and this distinction then between church and state became even more uh, clear. Luther and Calvin were called magisterial reformers because they worked through the magistrate to establish the church. Grebel and others were called radical reformers because they believed in a radical distinction between church and state. Government was not to be involved. All right. I think we've gone as far as we can go with the time we have. Two kingdoms, the two kingdoms theology of Luther and other reformers would later be revisited by Abraham Kuyper and Richard Niebuhr um, and would be, again, tweaked. Um, that in, in Kuyper's thinking in particular, the relationship between church and state or the the relationship of the Christian to civil authority was a transformational relationship. In other words, the church had a responsibility under the Great Commission through the preaching of the gospel to transform hearts in the left-hand kingdom. The church was not a part of the left-hand kingdom. Uh, the church was to be pure, a pure church, uh, to as closely conform to the invisible church as possible by being careful who you admit through baptism, Um, We're to be as closely conformed to the invisible church as possible and through the transforming work of the gospel are to be an influence in the left-hand kingdom for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That makes sense. Next week, I hope that is somewhat clear. If you have questions, please feel free to come talk to me. I'll be happy to help. And next week, we're going to jump forward and talk about then the American Revolution and in particular, how this theology of two kingdoms Um, becomes more a theology of Christian resistance at the time of the revolution. We'll get there next week. All right, let's pray together. Uh, Father in heaven, um, thank you, Lord, again um, for the blessing you've afforded us of talking about this. Uh, I pray, Lord, in the weeks to come that you continue to bless uh, these concepts, these thoughts, this scripture to our heart and mind, that you'd help us to understand um, what was going on what is going on, how we're to understand these things, and then how we are to properly relate uh, and help us, Lord, from this uh, determine 
uh, how we are to live in our present generation, this wicked generation, perverse generation, and help us to do that faithfully for you as we seek to preach the gospel and be an influence to this uh, wicked world. Uh, We need you, Lord, in this. Help us to understand. Uh, Lead us, direct us, we pray, by your spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen.